Thank you, Brother Silas. Uh, sometimes, you know, I feel like Christian. Remember when he was on the pathway to the celestial city and Satan was on the path there and he said, you will not go. And he had to do battle with him right there. Sometimes I feel like that. You know, Satan attacked me just before I got up here and said, I'm going to zap the energy out of you. You know, when I thought that how much, you know, when Sarah wasn't here to read my scripture, if you knew how much she would like to be here, mm -hmm. you know, so, you know, I, uh, why do we, when I look out among the brethren, I see brethren who desire God, who desire the kingdom of God, they're pressing, and, and, from, and from, every, from, from every viewpoint, you see, you see brethren who are gathered for, for the right reason. Then why would we get up here and preach the way we do? Why would we exhort the brethren to take hold and stand firm and, and get a hold of the things? Why would we preach like that? You know, I think when we get to glory, we're going we're gonna to preach like we're in glory. You know, we're going we're gonna to preach and, and, or we're going to talk and we're going to glorify God as those who have arrived. It's going to be different than the way we preach and teach today. You see, so, so while we get up here and we exhort the brethren to take hold of these things, to turn loose of the world, it's because we haven't arrived yet. We're going to, we talk different now. That's why we get up here and we preach these things. So um, I, uh, that, that's, I, I wanted to point that out this morning. Why would we say some of the things that we're going to say? Actually, our text is really from uh, verse 10 all the way to, uh, oh, about, I think about 16th. Because I think that's the best we can. It kind of breaks that up, and Paul kind of makes a different uh, train of thought. But I'm going to focus on 10, but I'm going to make up some uh, references to the other scriptures too. And once again, brethren, we're going we're gonna to point to the manner of maintaining spiritual life. Every time we look into scripture like this, our focus is brought to how much that particular individual, in particular in Corinthians here, how much Paul is, makes references to Christ Jesus. And so we'll, uh, 17 times Paul refers to Christ in this first chapter. Ten times in the first ten verses. Now he didn't mention him in verse 5, but again Christ was used twice in verse 2. So uh, that's... that's that, that tells you a little bit about what our focus should be, doesn't it? So we want to, first thing we want to do is just notice how many times uh, references are made to deity in that particular, the one who is administrating salvation, Jesus Christ. We know by experience, don't we? We can't afford to disregard Jesus Christ as our priority. Of course, we never want to do that. But if we do, I ask, can you afford to pay the price? You know, uh, because we pay a high price if we get distracted and lose our priority. When we, ne when we neglect the Lord, well, we do it at our own peril and our own risk. Uh, i tell you, you know, regardless of, uh, regardless of the place you're at, whether you're on the mountaintop or in a, a cold, dark valley, all our attention must be on Jesus all the time. Uh, when you're on the mountaintop, you'll keep that blessing when you keep Jesus as the center of it and not on the experience, mountaintop experience. And when you're in a valley, same thing's true. We don't focus on the conditions there in the valley, but we, we focus on the one who's going to get us out of there. So in every experience, whether there's a very high one or the very low one, that Jesus is always the one we center on. This letter confirms it's, this is the manner of salvation for all the saints. Now the brethren here, we already know they're in a bad spot. And if they take heed, Paul is going to help them get back. That's something that who, every, this is not unique just to Paul. All the brethren, okay, anyone who is following Christ and has an understanding of the Lord can do this very same thing. Uh, this is why uh, this letter has more references, as you know, to Jesus Christ than any other letter in the New Testament, incidentally. Uh, just barely, but it has more references than the letter in Romans, for example. It's the same, same amount of chapters. And though the Gospels are primarily uh, a, an account of Jesus Christ, this book here has, all, has more references in Christ than all the Gospels combined. I thought that was... Uh, because, you know, he's dealing with a, a, a situation there, see? And uh, so we make mention of this again... Uh, who is the writer that uh, 
who is it really that opens up uh, Jesus Christ and really focuses, uh, brings Christ into focus for us? Well, then it's, uh, it's the, who, who makes known the person of Christ anyway, really, in, in, our, in the record we've been given? Well, it's Paul. And it's Paul who ministers Christ to the brethren. He said to the Philippians, you remember, I pray that you abound more and more, that ye may be sincere and, without, sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. And to Galatia, I marvel, ye are so soon removed from him that called you unto the grace of Christ and to another gospel. So it's always Christ to Apostle Paul. Now let's say that you're an apostle of Jesus. And, and what would you do when all, all manner of the flesh is broken out and just overrun the camp, so to speak, and all, all kind of sin has been expressed? And when you're supposed to be uh, overcomers, we ourselves have been overcome. And... Uh, what would you do if you was an apostle? Well, knowing full well the reason for the conditions in Corinth, Paul turns, he attempts to turn the brethren's attention back to Jesus Christ. And because he knows that they've, they've been unplugged from Jesus and disconnected from him, that something else has taken a priority in their lives. And uh, this is not what the brethren intended to do. This is not what brethren intend to do when this has happened. They don't tend to do this. But you see, they've been, let, they've been deceived. Yeah. Someone has come along, and they've led them away from the Lord. And uh, later, Paul will make this clear. He'll ask the question. He'll say, uh, uh, who was crucified for you? So he'll, you know, he'll say, hey, you know, and uh, 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 who were you, whose name were you baptized into? So he's, he's trying to get them to, to think more clearly. This isn't the way it was when Paul was there among them. Uh, Paul could testify that they came behind and no gifts. Mm -hmm. The Spirit had given them every provision uh, in the assembly there. But the same gifts you know, that, that the Spirit had given them uh, that was to be used to edify the brethren, they're now being used by the flesh, and it, they were being used to their own uh, condemnation. So then as Paul begins to give his attention to the circumstances there, what is the first thing? that Paul brings their attention back to. It was this matter of divisions. Mm -hmm. this, situ this situation in Corinth now is different than ours, the situation we've got today. Today, we have a full-blown uh, division, mm -hmm. and uh, we've even learned how to justify it. But we've, what we've got today is, is it, it's a division. And, uh, I mean, we really do have division today, division within division and parties within division. Now, what would Paul say if he saw the divided modern church today? Sure. Well, he'd probably say he'd have to start with the same word he did with Corinth, that there'd be no divisions among you, that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment, that ye all speak the same thing. Yes. And I'm sure that Paul would get around to asking the same question, is Christ divided, yeah. brethren? Uh -huh. uh, but you know what, though? Paul is never going to be here again in this world. Uh, he's never going to address the modern church today. He, God has already given the word on this subject. It's, all, it's been, been faithfully delivered. It has been accurately recorded. And heaven's not going to speak on this again. Amen. That's the way it ought to be too, isn't Amen. it? The Spirit shouldn't have to go on and on and on about the same old thing, about things we've heard over and over and over because it, it's already been declared. It's one thing to be exhorted and comforted in Christ Jesus, reminded of the promises of God. That's uh, the things that are part of newness of life. And then it's another to be constantly admonished for not paying attention you know, to what it takes to receive God and, and to take hold of them, the things that God has given us. It's, that's two different things. Well, you know, we can say that Christ is not divided. We can answer Paul's question. No, the Lord is not divided. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and his teaching, brethren, certainly <laughs> didn't promote division. Mm -hmm. Not within the body of Christ it didn't. Mm -hmm. But division, that's what we have around us, nevertheless. And there's entirely too much controversy over doctrine okay there's too much to too disagreement over what the lord had to say and what the apostles said he said what the apostles taught you remember they he referred referred to as the apostles doctrine in acts 2 there was no more than what jesus uh taught them 
and what was later revealed and opened up to them, the doctrine of the Lord. And you know, there wasn't any division within the apostles, the 12 uh, disciples. The apostles. There was no division with them. There was 12 of them. And then we had Paul, who was an apostle to the Gentiles. He was in full. There was no agreement between he, the 12 apostles and, and Paul. There was no division, no party spirit with them. They were, they were completely united. Um, they, were, uh, they were of in agreement. They had the same mind and judgment about things. Uh, when it comes to this doctrine, this teaching, there is no freedom of opinion, brethren. Uh, there is no liberty for disagreement, not when Jesus taught. And what the apostles handed down to us is what he taught. The teaching of the Lord, matter of fact, they promote unity and oneness. Our Lord has some things to say. Uh, about oneness, and I want to I want to mention four of them to you real quickly. They're found in the seventeenth chapter mm -hmm. of John, twenty six verses, and he he mentioned he references oneness and unity four times there. That they may be one as we are one. That they may all that's number one. Number two, that they all may be one as Thou Father art in me, and I in Thee. That they also may be one in us. That the world may believe that Thou hast sent me. Number two, that they may be one, even as as we are one. Three. I in them and thou in me, that they may be perfect in one, that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast lovest me. All of these in that one chapter. And these are found there. And they're a testimony of what Jesus thought about oneness. Those proclaiming to be in Christ should be able to see then. The overwhelming thought in Jesus' mind was unity and of being, of being one. And this oneness of the Son and the Father, that it would belong to the, to the children as well. And the truth of the matter is, brethren, genuine unity. This oneness and this unity that Jesus was talking about, it does exist among the people of God. Amen. Babylon, the spirit that moves the modern church, she's recognized, contrary, she's recognized by her divisions. That's how she's known. And she allows for this condition to exist. And she promotes some kind of crazy union that's based on the right to divide and disagree. She excuses and she overlooks division because contentions and controversy is commonplace there, isn't it? Now, the testimony of the Lord is clear that it was his will the people of God are one with him, be united with him. The divided modern church has given a false witness to the world by their divided state. Brethren, these things need to be said. And they show the world that they do not belong to the family of God. Okay? They, and they've condemned themselves. The world doesn't believe that Jesus was sent from the Father and they do not, because they do not speak with one voice. Now, this is a condition that could cause us despair. But it doesn't because we're reminded that our God, He creates and He manages all these things. And we know that all these things will work to the praise of God in Christ Jesus. But the testimony is here, brethren. We have it here in the print. There's a judgment coming, and actually this judgment has already begun. Matthew 12, 25, and Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. Mm -hmm. It's about oneness in Christ, and it's about singleness of thinking and devotion. There is only, and it begins with each one of us, there is only room for one predominant pursuit in a person's life. Mm -hmm. it cannot, we cannot profess to be pursuing Christ and really be pursuing other things, mm -hmm. whatever they may be, financial gain, uh, uh, jobs and career and all these things. And, and uh, we can't be thinking that we have Christ as the main thing when really other things are more important. Uh, good things, you know, like kids and family. But, uh, you know, uh, we don't mean for these kind of things to happen. Mm -hmm. But it does. It happens. And when it does, it means we've got our interest uh, in the wrong. They're in conflict mm -hmm. with the Lord. Mm -hmm. Now, this is critical because the salvation cannot be obtained. You know, it's the way it's been designed. Salvation cannot be obtained with a divided interest. God is designed it this way, that the physical realm and our own bodies are a great hindrance. It works against the saints obtaining God. Mm -hmm. And 
we, uh, we can't think. Now that we have Christ, it's going to be a downhill walk from here on out. Because, you know, we found it being an uphill walk, haven't we, actually? Uh, for each one of those who are in, uh, in, in, in walking in faith, indeed, it's an uphill walk. And uh, the uphill push is designed, designed to be a full body effort, brethren. Uh, all the members have to work together for this uphill push and this uphill climb. I'm thinking of the wall that Nehemiah, Nehemiah helped supervise in the day. When they, you know, they had to work with one hand and, and hold the sword or be ready with the sword in the other. It took all of them working together to rebuild the wall. The spirit of unity will bring harmony to the members. When the Lord is the absolute center of our affections, when he's the absolute center of our affections, mm -hmm. the spirit will naturally lead us, naturally lead us into unity mm -hmm. and his teachings of godliness and holiness. Mm -hmm. There's a great freedom. In the spirit of Christ, really there is. There's great flex flexibility in salvation, but it's with the full understanding that there's only one God, one Lord and Spirit, faith, baptism. There's only one gospel. There's not one for each differing party group. There's not just one for all the people of God. Our freedom in Christ is found in our faith. And as the Spirit works in the pure heart and the cleansed conscience, well, the brethren, we work out our salvation uh, together in the, in the doctrine of godliness and holiness, which the Lord taught. Yes. His doctrine was known for being godly and holy. Mm -hmm. We work it out together, and we do so in the bond of peace mm -hmm. and in the unity of the love of Jesus Christ. Yes. Those who approach life in Christ as a rich, some kind of rigid system, uh, with, they, they, they do not allow for any flexibility for the people of God or themselves. They, they do they, whatever they use, whether it's a creed or some kind of rules or something. They, they're not living according to faith. and uh, They make void the grace of God and all kind of things that just rule out God altogether in his spirit. Uh, I say we work it out in the unity of the spirit of Christ and we work it out together. That is, we work out our salvation among one another as we interact with one another. We don't work out our salvation independently from one another. I'm convinced of that or I wouldn't be here today. I'm not saying that an isolated body member can't, can't make it to glory. That's a, circum, that's a special circumstance that's been created by God and he'll manage that, that situation. But we know that this is not the intent of God. This was not the intent of the, uh, of the body design. Salvation was designed for, us to, for it to be achieved together as a body. Paul calls the situation in Corinth a divided one. That's what he calls it. He calls it a divided one. He said that there'd be no divisions among you. And most translators, they use the word divisions. And I was thinking as though this division had already existed when he... When, when uh, Cleo reported to him that we, the situation, there was division. That's why he called it division, okay? And, con and I, I think he was speaking of the uh, division had already existed because of the word contentions that's used in 11 first, because there be contentions among you. So there was already division there. I wanted to make that clear. The word used for divisions in Scripture it's, it's for your information, it's, it's the same word usually to describe something that has been rent or torn apart. It's, uh, the word is used by Jesus to describe what happens when you patch an old garment with new cloth. The garment is washed, the new patch shrinks, the, old gar the garment is torn again, and the tear is worse than the, and the former. When the body is rent, it is torn, it is divided. How many, how many members of the body does it take to rent the body? Two, half, three, a dozen, or maybe just one member? How many does it take to divide and, and, and tear the body? One member that has removed itself from the body. And not necessarily now. We're not talking about a physical removal, okay? When you, well, you know at Corinth, Paul speaks of division within the assembly. But they were all still meeting in the same location. The assembly was still meeting together. They had not yet separated from one another into completely differing groups like we see today. And for this reason, Paul can address them in one letter, all of them. 
because they were still meeting under the same, within the voice of that letter. And what was reported to Paul, I want you to know Babylon would not consider division today. But then again, what does Babylon know about spiritual life? I'm sorry. Uh, but Paul mentions four of them in particular, talking about divisions, four divisions. Modern commentators, they want to call them cliques and, 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 and that kind of thing like that. But see, Paul doesn't call them cliques. Paul calls them division. Divisions within the body of Christ. And even though they were all still meeting in the same building, they were not meeting as unified body of believers. We don't want to read this text with a, uh, a, a particular view we picked up somewhere else. You know, having a, division, having a definition of division that belongs to the sectarian world. When the modern church thinks about division, they think about a church split. That's a, a term not found in Scripture. They think about a, a number of members pulling out, leaving, and then uh, start their own group and, and, and because of some kind of uh, disagreement. But this is not the idea of divisions that Paul gives us here. I'm going to say that Paul defines the concept of the division as the Spirit of God defines it in verse 10. Not having the same mind and judgment. <laughs> Uh, it doesn't mean having the same level of understanding and knowledge in spiritual life. It doesn't mean that. It simply says having the same mind and judgment. Earlier we said the absence of divinity, the absence of division is unity. And uh, I don't see, and I studied this quite a bit, and I thought about it. I don't see... Now, you've got either one or the other. You've either got division or you've got unity. The Spirit never provided for there to be an in-between place, Amen. a place where it is not neither division nor unity. I like a neutral place where a member just can sit out till they make up their mind, you know. Uh, Paul teaches us that there can be division when we are not of the same mind and judgment. You don't have to pull out and take some folks with you and hire a preacher and start your own group to have division. Mm -hmm. Assembly can have division, brother, right in the middle of everything. Uh -huh. I'm not going to quit going. I'm just not going to just fully enter in either. Kind of frame of mind. Paul said be of the same mind and judgment. Mm -hmm. In Corinth, it had gotten to the point, this thing had grown to the point, that not being of the same mind and judgment had manifested itself in contentions among them. And you know that eventually that's what happens, see, when you, when you turn loose to flesh, when you're going to have that kind of situation. Considering the body of Christ's perspective, <coughs> Paul is contemplating Christ as the center of unity here. We could say at this point, the body of Christ in Corinth, in view of the definition we've given, that they were fractured, they were broke, mm -hmm. and they were broken. I, bet, I think the best way to see it is that the, is in terms of effectiveness, the assembly was broken, mm -hmm. the body was broken. You know, this term also is the term that a physician would use to set a bone. Mm -hmm. See, so did you, if we use that same thing Paul, so Paul used, you, that assembly was broken. It is impossible that men who are not born again, to be of the same mind, mind and judgment. It's impossible for them to do it all. But just because we're born again doesn't mean we are of the same mind and judgment. It just means that we can be. Yeah. It means that it's possible to be of the same mind and judgment. Otherwise, it's completely out of your realm. It just uh, means we can be. And that's what Paul is telling them. He's saying, be of the same mind and the same judgment. Paul, he said in the most earnest, earnest terms too, he said in the most earnest terms, uh, Paul said, I beseech thee, brethren, for the sake of the name of Jesus Christ, let us be this way. Mm -hmm. He is chiefly speaking to the congregation at Corinth, mm -hmm. addressing in particular their problems. But can't you see here, can't you tell he's speaking to all of us mm -hmm. everywhere? It is the very last thing. It's the very last thing we would ever think about doing, you know, to bring disadvantaged mm -hmm. To, to, the, to those whom for Christ has died. We wouldn't want to do that. But that's what we do, brethren, when we're not of the same mind and judgment. Of the same mind and judgment that, then. That's, uh, that's when we're all pulling together and when we're all pushing together. 
fighting and working together. When we have a sense of this, that's what we're doing. Living at the fullest to bring uh, salvation to his body. And do know this, brethren, that it is the body that will be presented to God on that day. We have to fight against this thinking, uh, this individualistic mindset when we think Christ is bringing me to glory. Uh, we get all teary-eyed and, and we get all choked up when we think about Christ is bringing me to glory. And, and it is true. We will end up in glory individually. But, uh, but the scriptures, uh, they say he's bringing many sons to glory. And that many constitutes the body of Christ. I know that we're going there as individuals, but that's not the way the scriptures teach us to think about it. Uh, Paul has the highest view, doesn't he? You could say Paul has the highest view when he's speaking. Paul himself was chosen and called, not for Paul, though, but he was put to work. He's going to do a work for the body of Christ. And he's going to do it like, like he said, nobody worked harder than me. All of his work was for the body of Christ. Individuals, then, you, you can begin to think, they're, they're only important that, that they make up the body of Christ. Uh, individual members are important because we constitute the bride of Christ. Jesus is the head of the body, and he's our head. He's your head because you've been added to that body. The scriptures don't teach a salvation that's independent of the body of Christ. Amen. That's the way uh, the Babylon teaches us, I think I know. But uh, I tell you, there's a lot of people... I'm going to tell you, now, I'm speaking to brethren that are sensitive to God. I'm speaking to brethren that I know is on live stream. I know them brethren, they're sensitive to God. You know, but still we have to speak in this way. There's a lot of, there's a lot of God's people that just going to have to wake up. They, I'm serious. And forget all that stuff, all, I, all that junk that Babylon let them have. And it's high time that the people of God, they just get this residue off of them. You know, it's just, uh, you, you can't have it on you in the kingdom of God and expect to survive. The saints, we don't like Babylon, and we don't like to be reminded of it. Now, Amen. previous exposure to the world, it makes us especially vulnerable to Satan. Brother Given brought this out this morning. A and afterwards, after we come into the kingdom, Satan tries to gain access again through that exposure we had. And whatever degree that you knew this world, well, that's the degree by which Satan can come against you. Oh, yeah. That's just the way it is. Uh -huh. I've seen one of these doors. It belongs to the world also. It's also of the flesh, but it's a door of, of a worldly religion. Amen. Those who have tasted of it, and they find it hard not to leave this door cracked open just a little bit. I can, maybe it's because it's a religious door. But uh, there's a lot of things Babylon said was okay. And okay to think. And, and, and a lot of things that we could do, they are wrong. And uh, to mix Jesus with this world is wrong. And the modern church does it, and it's, it's a lie. I just have to tell you, it's a lie. Amen. I want to exhort you, brethren, this morning. I want to re-examine what you're thinking, what you're thinking. And, uh, and I want you to, it, it, it has, did Babylon teach you to think this way? And if he did, throw it to the side. It's contaminated you. And uh, why do I go off in this direction? Uh, why do I say so much about Babylon? Well, uh, I say these things because they're a hindrance to spiritual life. And they're not only hindrances to you, brethren, but they're hindrances to the body of Christ. You see, it's a body thing. And, uh, and it all has to do with being of the same mind and judgment. We have been truly called. We have been called to be perfectly joined together. How many people, have, how many of God's people have made a commitment to Christ? But they haven't really made it to the body of Christ yet. You know? Uh, perfectly joined together. It cannot be done by the flesh. It can't be done in the flesh. It's as similar to that same exhortation that Paul gave Timothy in the second letter third chapter, that a man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works, thoroughly furnished, perfect and complete, perfectly joined together. How is it that Paul wants us to be of the same mind and judgment then? Perfectly joined together. Now, I, now I really believe that Paul meant that the brethren can certainly be perfectly joined together in the same mind and judgment. I don't, I don't think that he told us that ye be that we're something that we really couldn't attain to. 
I can't see where Paul made this conditional. In other words, I can't see where Paul made this conditional in any, any way, except that he did say that ye all speak the same thing. That's the only condition I can see anywhere in there. And in order to truthfully speak the same thing, though, we must be of the same mind and judgment in these matters. So from, from, whom, from whom there is required not merely one faith, but one confession. And it's more than that even. And ye all speak the same thing doesn't mean we speak the same way. But rather the brethren teach and preach the same thing to declare an agreement, not only in words, but in that same mind and judgment uh, of, a, of a oneness and complete unity. Brethren can't speak the same thing unless they've been perfectly joined together in mind and judgment. And not be, not be just a parrot or something. Uh-huh. Uh, if it really belongs to you, you can't. That, we, that when you speak, that you speak in agreement, uh-huh. is what he was saying. These three words, perfectly joined together, they actually come from one word, just to let you know that. And, uh, and that the word is used uh, uh, oftentimes much similar to the word... Uh, used in other places, and I'm going to make a reference to this. This word is used when Jesus spotted James and John and their father mending the nets, and that's when he called to them. They were fixing their torn nets is what they were doing when he called to them. Oftentimes the word is translated, trying to give you the doctrine of the word, oftentimes the word is translated straight out, perfect. Mm -hmm. Another one of Paul's exhortation when he said, be Perfect. He said, be perfect. Used also was, uh, in, in Romans when he said, vessels of wrath fitted for destruction. It's the same word there. The worlds were framed by the word of God, Hebrews 10, that ye which are spiritual restore such a one. Galatians. And after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, and strengthen and settle you. The same word. 1 Peter 5, to say the very least, this is something that's got to be done, isn't it? Uh-huh. To, in, in some cases, it involves a correction that needs to be made. That's what Paul is talking about mm-hmm. when he says, perfectly joined together. Something's got to be done, fixed, mended. And uh, to set a bone, uh, mend a fishing net. It, it, uh, in other times, if we see in the, scripture, in the other scriptures, it requires finishing or completing or refining something, making something perfect, uh, a finishing of something, or framed and fitted. It, it, means, it means that the, we can say immediately that Paul was calling for an obvious, he was calling for a correction to be done in Corinth. He was calling the brethren to mend and sit and, and fix that broken situation there. Yeah. This required the brethren to be reconciled to one mm-hmm. so that peace through understanding could be uh, be restored and, and, and to them a real reconciliation that involved uh, both uh, um, uh, having the same mind and judgment. The exhortation is for the people of God to achieve this same state of being perfected, uh-huh. of being fittedly framed and fitted. And it's necessary exhortation, particularly when unity is not present. Perfectly joined together, I don't know about you, you may have noticed a similarity. Sounds so much like what Paul said in Ephesians 4.16. For whom the whole body fittedly joined together and compacted that which uh, by every joint supplied. I immediately thought of this verse, and I, and I went over there, and I wanted to see. And uh, it sounds similar, and it is similar, but Paul is speaking about some different aspects of it. For this is not the same word, and, it, and, and uh, although we can't... Uh, Scrutinize it very much because Paul only used this word two times, both in Ephesians. So we really can't pick up the sense in other, uh, other places of Scripture. But um, fiddly joined together. Now Paul, he is describing there in this Scripture, and you, you very well know what he's talking about here. He describes how the body operates and how it functions when it's perfectly joined together. See, this, this situation that he's talking about in Ephesians, this assumes or presumes that they've been perfectly joined together. Then he can go about talking about how the body will operate. Do you know, see, so we have a, a joining together that is perfectly maintained by the Spirit of the Lord. Paul told those in Rome, be of the same mind one 
toward another. Mind not high things, but consent to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceit. And it's, again, Paul, now the may the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded, one toward another, according to Christ Jesus. Uh, according to Christ Jesus, our, our uh, attention is focused toward Jesus. He wants them to think on this. And he asked them three questions. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul or some other name? The thinking of the brethren must be centered on Christ. And all their judgments must come as a result of having a mind that is wholly given to him. That's the only way we can have the same mind and judgment. It will never come from a creed or something like that. If we want the spirit to completely dominate in our lives, we must strive to be of the same mind and judgment. Now, we don't need somebody to get up here and break this down for us, what it means via the, main, the same mind and judgment. Paul didn't do that. Paul didn't make a list of things to do and don't, and then that to help you. This will help you be of the same mind and judgment. Paul didn't do that, and I don't think we need to do that either. Uh, those who have made every effort to disentangle themselves from the world and any other kind of previous contact they had, those who've had a great desire uh, for, for the body of Christ to be saved, well, the Spirit will direct them in this thing. In fact, that's why Paul didn't address the specifics of it. And brethren will be directed to address it. Brethren who get up to speak, I don't care how, what, in what capacity, they'll address this thing. The Spirit will direct them. You've got to believe this. And brethren will move this along according to the Spirit working in them. I'm saying, I'm not saying here that we're not of the same mind and judgment. Uh, I'm not saying that that we've got a situation like that on our hands. I'm saying that the brethren of God are always, always called to be diligent in these matters, to be, to be aware of, of this is kind of thing. Like I said before I even started, you know, the reason we teach and preach like we do is because of the situation we faced. And uh, every step we take away from this world and every step we take away from any kind of thing we was involved in before, the more perfect we become. In, in our thinking. And uh, you know, you remember how sensitive Paul was. To, uh, he, didn't need, he didn't need to wait for, uh, so for there to be a big old terrible thing mm -hmm. to happen. The police were called in and they had a big fight in the church and they, there was a big split. Paul was, was, his, he wasn't that um, insensitive. Yeah. He was very sensitive. Mm -hmm. Any kind of anything that presented itself in the congregation that was disruptive to the spirit, he was sensitive to it. You see how far we've gone in our day, don't you? And uh, so we, uh, if we can see then how sensitive Paul was to uh, any kind of disharmony and disruption uh, we have. Paul's not addressing what we got today here, I'm telling you. That's, I mean, he addresses it, but... Uh, his sensitivity, sensitivity to disharmony and disruption is, is far more sensitive uh, than, than what we've got today. He, and his thinking, he's in the heavenly realm, you know, when, when he was talking to Corinth. Uh, I want to close with this verse here. Uh, I, I was, I draw, I'm drawn to the scripture a lot when I, when I think about uh, harmony and unity and oneness and the body of Christ and the effectiveness of the spirit and how that... Uh, how God immediately responds to this, 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 this thing, just showing you how these brethren was on the right track. It confirms the response from heaven. And when they had prayed, this place was shaken where they were assembled together. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they spake the word of God with boldness. And the multitude of them that believed were one heart, one soul, Neither said any of them that ought of the things which was possessed of his own, but they had all things common. So, brother, and these, uh, they, were, they were not one, and, uh, and as a result of the Spirit coming in, uh, but they were, they were of one heart and of one soul, of the same mind and judgment before they prayed. So, thank you, brother.